When Steve Heimler of Heimler's History signed up to be on my YouTuber Family Tree series, he only knew a little bit about his family history, which basically amounted to the fact that they had lived in Michigan for generations and had some Irish ancestry. So we were quite surprised when Steve took an ancestry DNA test and had a significant amount of unexpected DNA. Where did it come from? After discovering this, my main goal was to identify Steve's ancestors connected to this surprise DNA and then uncover their story. And what I uncovered was quite amazing. Hello everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and on today's video, I will be discussing the story of Steve Heimler's Jewish ancestry. Steve Heimler is the host of Heimler's History a YouTube channel which he started in 2017, which puts out educational content related to advanced placement or AP courses. Steve is a high school teacher and has even read thousands of AP history essays for AP exam scoring. Heimler's history quickly grew through the years with the most recent milestone being 400,000 subscribers at the beginning of October 2022. Steve has also expanded his brand to a website offering different study services as well as a second channel to help teachers. When I first spoke to Steve to see if he was interested in being a guest on this series, he told me that he didn't really know much about his family history and wanted to make sure that that wasn't going to be an issue. Hey Jarrett, here's what I know about the Sheldon Franks side of my family. He was my maternal grandfather. He died when I was maybe five or six. Uh, he lived with my grandma in Livonia, Michigan. Her parents also lived in Michigan. I think it was Livonia. Pretty close, if not Livonia. That was Thomas um, and Charlotte McComb. Uh, Thomas was born in Ireland, uh, Belfast, so Northern Ireland. And um, my my grandma, I, I don't know, or my great grandma, I'm not sure her maiden name. It might have been it must be brown. She, she was definitely born in America, although I'm not sure where. And that's about all I know about that side of the family. So, I don't know. We'll see. He gave me the little bit of information he knew, and it was enough to get things started. But I also suggested doing a DNA test, which Steve promptly ordered. While we waited for the results, I built out the tree from what Steve gave me and was quickly able to build out to his great-grandparents and then start focusing on different lines. Both sides of his family seemed to have deep lines in Michigan, just as Steve had told me. I also noticed his line tracing to Irish ancestry and a few lines back to early Ontario and Quebec, although that's a story for another day. Then we got Steve's DNA results and something really stood out. Steve had 12% Jewish ancestry. Now, 12% is quite significant because it's equivalent to a great-grandparent. And I had all of his great-grandparents identified, so it was likely one of them had Jewish ancestry. Now I had to figure out which one. At this point in researching Steve's family tree, I had only worked on half the lines in depth, but I could easily rule those out. One great-grandparent had German Catholic roots, another great-grandparent had Dutch roots, and two great-grandparents had Irish roots. So that left four great-grandparents who might be Jewish. Arthur Stephen Wozniak and his wife Irene on Steve's father's side, and Louis Bernard Franks and Loretta Bertha Koch on Steve's mother's side. So I started with the great-grandparents on his paternal side. Arthur Stephen Wozniak was born in 1917 to Frank Wozniak and Helena Sigilska. I quickly found that Frank and Helena were all buried at St. Joseph Cemetery in South Bend, Indiana. The family plot and other records seemed to indicate that they were Polish and Catholic. There were a few relatives who were DNA matches to Steve who were related through Frank's siblings and a few through Helena's siblings, which allowed me to correlate whether or not there was Jewish ancestry here. The basic idea being, if Steve inherited his Jewish ancestry through this side, then the other descendants should also get significant readings of Jewish DNA. None of Steve's DNA matches through this family showed any Jewish readings, so we could easily rule out Arthur. Looking at Arthur's wife Irene, whose surname we didn't really know, was somewhat of a roadblock in the research because records and hints just weren't matching up. I soon realized that at some point in time, a researcher accidentally mixed up Steve's great-grandmother Irene 
with another Irene who had married a man named Edward Wozniak. This was confirmed through Irene's marriage to her second husband, Clarence S. Ballou, as well as her listing in the index from Social Security claims, confirming Irene's parents were Stephen Bacori and Mary Phillips. A look into Irene's parents showed they were both originally from Hungary, Mary arriving as a toddler in 1898 and Stephen arriving as a teenager in 1910. I soon found that they were buried in Sacred Heart Cemetery in South Bend, Indiana, which is a Catholic cemetery. There were no confirmed DNA matches that I could find through this side of the family, so I wasn't able to correlate whether or not there was Jewish readings in the DNA, but it seemed very unlikely that this part of the family was Jewish. So then I turned to the parents of Steve's maternal grandfather, Sheldon Robert Franks. Loretta's parents were William Koch and Pauline Nemitz. Their obituary seemed to indicate the family was part of the Evangelical and Reformed Church, so they seemed unlikely to have Jewish ancestry. Luckily, there were some really close relatives from this side through Loretta's siblings, and none of them showed any Jewish readings, ruling out Loretta and leaving one possibility. Steve's great-grandfather, Louis Bernard Franks. And if we couldn't find any Jewish ancestry here, that meant that we either had an NPE or not parrot expected somewhere in the tree, or we went wrong somewhere in the research. So I turned to the main sources I'd been using in this research, death records and obituaries. I quickly found Louis's obituary, and there it stated that Louis's funeral was officiated by a rabbi. And so it seemed we had found our likely Jewish ancestor. But we still needed more to confirm, and in order to do that, we needed to find out the family's story, figure out where they came from, and then correlate that with records as well as DNA. So I started with Lewis's story. Lewis was born in Michigan in 1904 to Sidney Frank and Jenny Rich. Lewis was the youngest of his siblings, and a look at the 1910 census shows he was the only one of his siblings to be born in the US. Lewis worked most of his life in the factories around Detroit, having seemed to start in auto factories, but then moving on to paper factories. Lewis's World War II draft record from 1940 showed that he was working for the Hind and Dausch Paper Company, which had opened a factory in Detroit just a year prior in 1939. Hind and Dausch Paper Company was founded in 1888 in Ohio and specialized in making corrugated boxes. The company had opened factories all over the country and became world known for their products, but the employees were not happy with their working conditions. On July 17, 1946, the workers at the Detroit Hind and Dausch plant went on strike for 13 weeks, one of seven factories across the country who had done so that year. The strike ended after it was agreed to that the workers would receive a 23 and a half cent raise per hour and the company would cover maintenance of membership in the union. Lewis was likely part of this strike, but by 1950 it seemed Lewis was no longer working. It's unknown exactly why Lewis stopped working, but there was a clue in his obituary when he died seven years later in 1957, saying Lewis was a patient of the Detroit hospital for seven years. So Lewis was likely unemployed due to whatever he suffered from very possibly something related to his work. Could it have been an injury he got at the factory? Very possibly. But something I found of interest was that the plants for Hind and Dausch Paper Company, including the plant in Detroit, are listed as known asbestos job sites. So instead of an injury, it might have actually been an illness. It certainly makes me wonder whether or not that had an impact on why Lewis couldn't work starting around 1950 and what ultimately led to his death. I was hoping to pull up his death certificate, which should list a cause of death and give a better idea of what it was he was suffering from for seven years. But due to Michigan law, his death certificate won't be available for another five years. So we'll just have to wait. Now, I still didn't have a good idea of the family history, so I started to look into Lewis's parents, Sidney and Jenny. Sidney and Jenny had arrived in America around 1903 Sidney worked for himself as a liquor merchant in Detroit, selling liquor and wine. His nephew Max, son of Sidney's oldest brother Isaac, was also living with Sidney in 1910 and working as a clerk, likely for Sidney. I looked further into the family and discovered that they had been in the liquor business since the 1880s when Sidney's younger brothers Charles and Samuel 
immigrated to Chicago and opened their own wholesale liquor business. In 1909, they moved to Detroit, possibly motivated by the fact that their older brother Sidney had already been living in Detroit. But things would take a turn for the family on November 8, 1916, when Michigan would amend its constitution to prohibit the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. This amendment wouldn't become law until 1918, but it would only be a few years before the 18th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution, creating a federal prohibition of alcohol. It's unknown exactly how difficult this time was for the family, but they seemed to pivot quite well to a wholesale grocery business, and Sydney would eventually go into real estate along with a few other family members. Sydney stayed in real estate until 1934 when he was hit by a car at the intersection of Petoskey Avenue and Davison Street in Detroit. Sydney lived only a block away from where he was struck at 4204 Clement Street in Detroit, with the same house that he lived in still standing today. So it's likely that he was either just walking to or from his house. The car was being driven by 50-year-old Mrs. Myrtle E. Taylor, who was questioned by the police after the accident but soon released. Sydney unfortunately died later that day after being taken to the hospital. Sydney's death certificate indicates that he died from internal bleeding due to a fractured left chest. The newspapers played up the fact that he was the 62nd death from traffic in Detroit that year. This was because traffic laws and regulations were still in their infancy, and many people were already calling for more regulations due to the high number of injuries and deaths due to the ever-increasing traffic around the country. Sydney's death certificate also gave another interesting piece of information. His parents, Herschel Frank and Mary Cohen, and their origin in Lithuania. So now I wanted to find what town in Lithuania did they come from and hopefully learn more about the family. I decided to use what's known as the FAN method, which stands for Family, Associates, and Neighbors. The idea being that by researching other people in the family or associates and neighbors, you may be able to discover the answer you are looking for. In doing this, I was able to find the U.S. passport application for Sydney's nephew, Joseph Frank, and in that document, it showed his origin as Marianopol, Lithuania which I soon discovered stood for Mary Ample. I also found the death record for Sydney's younger brother, Samuel David Frank, which listed their parents as being born in Mariupol, Lithuania. And these types of variations of spelling on the town of origin is not an uncommon thing, especially with these towns that were very hard to decipher for someone who spoke English. After finding a few other records showing other family members also listing Mary Ample, I turned to Jewish Gen to learn more. Utilizing a lot of the Litvox SIG databases, I was able to build out a fairly extensive family tree and actually find out a good bit of information on the family. Sydney's father, Hirsch, was also known as Hirsch Naftali Frank and also had the Hebrew name of Svi, which is common for Jewish men named Hirsch because both words mean deer, Svi being deer in Hebrew and Hirsch being deer in German and Yiddish. Amongst the available records was the birth for Hirsch in 1837 to Niesel Frank and Chaya Gittel, Hirsch's father, Niesel, who is also found as Nissan and Nissan in the records, was listed as a trader, peddler, and a laborer. It's unknown where Niesel was born, but he was born around 1811 to Haywish Frank and Malka, Steve's fifth great-grandparents. Haywish was born in 1779 and possibly the first generation to have born there based on the records I saw. Records also show that Haywish worked as an innkeeper and seller of alcohol, something his eldest son Chaim would also take up, and something that I found quite intriguing being that the family went into the liquor business in the US, meaning that the family may have been selling liquor for over a hundred years. In 1812, just a little over a year after the birth of his son Niesel, Haywish likely saw Napoleon's army as they retreated through the town of Mariampol, possibly even witnessing Napoleon himself. Family lore from multiple cousins of steeds from different sides of the Frank family indicated that Haywish may have been French and was actually part of Napoleon's army. Haywish's story says that he settled in Mariampol after deserting in the town and marrying a local Jewish girl, taking the name Frank because he was the Frenchman. Part of me doubts this story partially because the records show Haywish 
had multiple children before the invasion of Russia, who were then in Mariampol after the invasion, so we would have had to send for them. We also have the death record of Haywish's wife Malka, who died in 1837, and the records show she is the mother of Chaim and Niesel, the two oldest who were born in 1809 and 1811, respectively, before Napoleon's invasion, as well as the children after. This story of Haywish being a Napoleonic soldier certainly could be true, but I honestly think at best it may only be partially true based on the records I saw. In 1831, during the Polish Rebellion, a battle was fought in the town, and the rebels were said to have killed a wealthy Jewish family along with four of the community's leaders by hanging. People who Haywish likely knew. Looking at the death records for the town for 1831, we can actually see there were seven people listed as executed by hanging, two of whom have the Frank surname. The first was 50-year-old Nachman Frank, a butcher who was hung on May 25, 1831, along with a 30-year-old man named Shlom Berenson, who worked as a laborer. Four months later, on September 25, 1831, a 17-year-old boy named Abram Frank was also hung in a nearby town. It's not known if these were relatives of Haywish. I've still been trying to connect all the different Franks who are from Mariampol, but it seems likely. Haywish died in 1851 in Mariampol at the age of 72. Not much is known about Haywish's father Chaim, Steve's sixth great-grandfather, but we can estimate he was likely born sometime in the mid-18th century. When I found a death record for another son of Chaim named Abram, Abram's death record showed that Chaim's father was a man named Lazer, who was likely born in the early 18th century and makes him Steve's seventh great-grandfather. One of the goals that I had in this research was to try and connect all of the people with the surname Frank who were also connected to the town of Mariampol. In working to build that all out, I wasn't able to connect them all, but I was able to create two main trees. One tree descending from Steve's seventh great-grandfather, Laser Frank, and the second tree descending from a man named Oral Frank who also shows up in records as Aaron Frank. I'm hypothesizing that Laser and Oral were brothers, but that is something that has yet to be proven. It's also a possibility that they were just two separate families living in the same town who both happened to take the name Frank. And if that story of Haywish is true being a Napoleonic soldier, he might not have been the only Napoleonic soldier to settle in the town. And if that's the case, this other Frank family may have just taken that name because they were also a Napoleonic soldier. So there are multiple possibilities with this. It's unlikely any descendants of the Frank family still live in Mariampol. Many left starting in the 1880s and those that stayed were almost all murdered during the Holocaust. A look at Yad Vashem record shows nine people with the surname Frank from the town of Mariampol listed as murdered, although little information was given about them. It is likely most of them were killed on September 1st, 1941, when over 5,000 people from Mariampol were murdered by the Eisenstadt's commando troops under Karl Jaeger. All but 100 of those murdered that day were Jewish. The town is listed amongst the famous Jaeger Report, a detailed report by Karl Jaeger showing the number of people murdered by his troops from July to November of 1941. The Germans had entered Mariampol in July of 1941 and had already murdered a few hundred people in town throughout July of 1941 before their mass execution of the townspeople on September 1st. A memorial is placed near the mass grave in Mariampol, which can be visited today. A good friend of mine, Eli Rabinowitz, visited the town years ago and allowed me to use the photographs from his trip, which included stops around town and at the memorial. And after all of that research, I decided to check if we could find any DNA matches for Steve from the Frank side of his family and I was able to find multiple descendants of the Frank family. One cousin of Steve's who I actually got in touch with ended up sending me a family tree that had been created in 1960. This tree traced the family back to Haywish Frank and correlated with pretty much everything that I had found using the paper trail. 
as well as adding a whole lot of names that I didn't have, likely because they just didn't show up in the records for whatever reason. This old tree even mentioned Haywish being a Napoleonic soldier. One thing especially interesting about that fact, if true, Steve won't be the first guest on the series to have an ancestor who was a Napoleonic soldier who was part of the Russian invasion. The first guest who had that was Mr. Beat, and if you want to learn more about that, check out this video right here. Thank you to my patrons and YouTube members for helping support this channel.